thank you for joining us for today's webinar, How to Make AP Treasury Strategic Partner, brought to you by IOFM and sponsored by Envoice Pay. We have a few housekeeping notes to go over before we officially get started. If you have any technical questions or issues using the webinar platform, please use the chat box and I will respond right away. If you have any issues with the audio, please click on the phone icon located above the chat window to receive the teleconference information. For those that do need to call in to ensure call quality, everyone's lines have been muted today. But we do encourage you to ask questions throughout the webinar. Please type your questions into the chat box and hit send to submit them. And at the end of today's webinar, we will have our presenters answer questions. If we're not able to get to all questions, we will respond post-webinar via email. We will also have three polling questions during the webinar. A pop-up box will appear when we run each poll. Please choose from the multiple choice answers and hit submit. We would love your participation and insight today. This webinar will be recorded and you'll receive a thank you email with the on-demand materials within two business days. So our speakers for today are Jess Shear and Josh Cyphers. IOFM editor Jess Shear is an award-winning business reporter focused on the intersection of accounting, finance, and management. Before joining IOFM, Jess spent five years as process consultant helping organizations more effectively and efficiently manage end-to-end -end processes, including procure-to-pay and order-to-cash. Jess is a popular speaker, keynoting IOFM's annual conferences. His sessions draw his experience helping organizations create effective measurement approaches, conducting custom survey projects, as well as personally managing several large-scale benchmarking programs. Josh Cyphers is the Director of Financial Planning and Analysis at Envoice Bay. For over 20 years, Josh has provided global business and financial planning leadership for large enterprises, including Nike and Microsoft. He has also led treasury management and financial analysis functions in various roles. A consultant and former CPA, Josh has deep experience developing profitable growth strategies, actionable business intelligence, and competitive market analysis throughout a broad range of industries. And at this time, I would like to welcome our speakers and hand the webinar off to Jeff. Thank you so much, Laura. And thank you so much for attending. I've been really looking forward to this conversation for a while. As the executive editor at IOFM, I'm an advocate for our practitioners. And what I've been, the conversations I have all the time are helping practitioners and AP departments demand a seat at the table that they deserve with Treasury and other senior leaders in finance. And what's excited me about this conversation is when I start talking with my friend Josh Cyphers at Invoice Pay, is he's having the conversation from the other side, working with Treasury and identifying opportunities for helping Treasury deal with their biggest issues. And often those biggest issues are things that he's identifying that AP can help with. So between our two perspectives, I think we're going to have a great, great conversation. One of the reasons why it's so important to build a relationship with Treasury and with every senior person inside of finance is that everything that you want to accomplish, every improvement you want to make to your AP function or your procure-to-pay cross-functional process has a people process or technology component, and to make improvements in any of those requires buy-in from senior leaders. From a people perspective, sometimes it's prioritizing training budget from process. It's often getting senior leaders to go outside of AP to convince folks to follow the PO process and not utilize rogue spending, which is simply buying anything at any time for any price for any reason, or approving invoices faster. But the thing that we're going to focus on today is the technology component. Often there are inefficiencies around people on process. You can ring out, but you're going to hit a wall to make the biggest improvements, to, to generate the biggest savings and efficiencies, to drive the greatest profit, reduce the greatest risks, requires investment in automation, 
And that absolutely requires financial buy-in from senior leadership. So how do you garner that buy-in? The important part to keep in mind is thinking about the language that your senior leaders speak. For Treasury, typically it's one of two or sometimes both of these languages. It's either reducing risk. In the case of AP, it's we're talking about compliance risk and or improving profitability. And the great thing is the more efficient you are, the more you're able to drive both of these conversations. So understanding what motivates your, your treasurer, what motivates senior leaders in finance will help you identify the conversation, identify their motivation, and identify how you can get them to invest in the things that you know you need to do your job better. From a risk perspective, penalties are on the rise, right? They don't need to know the specifics, but you know as you're exiting the 1099 season that penalties increase this year. They're significant, they're daunting. OFAC violations are on the rise, and unclaimed property audits are something that every company is gonna to have to deal with. We saw this starting with the largest companies, and now we're seeing organizations of all sizes. I wanna take a pause here because I, I wanna um, understand to what extent unclaimed property, for example, is a risk for those of you on the phone with us. So for our first survey question, we're looking at the percentage of your checks that are cut through, uh, the, the percentage of payments rather that are made through checks or that are cut through ACH. And the reason this is an important question is, at least going forward, the more often you pay through ACH or electronic payments, the more you know immediately whether that check was cashed. On the flip side, which is the, the, the question here, if you're still making payments by paper check, it means that you've got potentially a couple weeks before you know if that paper check was cashed, and then you've got to start the due diligence process. So we're going to pause while, while you take these questions, while, while you answer this question. Typically what we see, and I'll be interested to see your responses in, in just a few seconds, is despite the fact that electronic payments are cheaper, it's cheaper for you, it's cheaper for the person that you're paying, and it reduces risk, there's still a lot of organizations that are still highly, highly reliant on paper checks. So we'll see your responses in just a few seconds. And keep in mind, while this will mitigate unclaimed property risks going forward, the look back period for unclaimed property can go back decades. So it won't affect your retroactive risk, but at least it can reduce risk going forward. So at, as expected, 57% uh, of participants on this call generate roughly half of your check, half of your payments by check. That is um, a startling number, unfortunately not a surprising number. So I would say for those of you that are looking at paper checks, my guess is there is a business case to be made both internally for the value of paper checks, but also an educational opportunity to involve vendors in getting them to accept electronic payments. But mitigating risk is only part of the equation. The other driver of, of automation is that it can drive profitability. It can convert your AP department from a cost center to a profit center. And here's just a cleanest example. Many of you may not be yet capturing early pay discounts. But going forward, I'm gonna suggest, this is something that you, you should absolutely consider. When we studied 300 of our members, what we identified was that currently, at least in 2018, one in five among best practice organizations, roughly one in five had an early pay opportunity. The average discount's roughly 2%. And even best practice organizations don't capture every opportunity. That number is closer to about 98%. So just quick back of the envelope kind of math. Everyone can take out their phone, open up the, the calculator, Start with your annual PO spend. Multiply that number by 0.2, multiply that number by 0.02, and then multiply that number by 0.98. And that's if you were doing a good job of capturing early pay discounts. This is the amount of money that you're potentially leaving on the table by not pursuing these. 
Now, I think that is a conservative number, and I think it's a conservative number for a couple reasons. As interest rates have continued to rise, and I think we're up, we, we've raised interest rates three times here in the U.S. in the last 12 to 18 months, vendors are increasingly eager to be paid early, right? If they've got big capital expenditures, they want to make sure that um, they have the cash they need for acquisitions or, or big facility upgrades, et cetera. And so they can't go out in the market and borrow cash at a 2% interest rate, right? That typical early pay discounts, 2%. And so they're increasingly eager to pursue an early pay discount. So instead of saying net 30 terms, we'll give you a 2% discount if you can pay us within 10 days. And so that number could easily climb from 20% of invoices to as high as 80% of invoices. The other part, the other reason I say this number is conservative is the more you're able to show procurement that you can consistently meet early pay deadlines, the more likely they are to negotiate early pay discounts. Mm -hmm. If on the flip side, they don't believe that you can meet those early payment standards, they're not gonna go out of the way to negotiate. But the other thing to keep in mind is that this isn't the kind of negotiation where if they ask for an early pay discount, they could give up something else. Because increasingly what we're hearing from, from vendors is that they would, they would love to offer an early pay discount or a dynamic discount if only they were asked. And so the old rule of thumb was that for every billion dollars in PO spend, there's about three to five million in early pay discounts. In 2019 and beyond, if those interest rates continue to climb, that number could easily climb to 12 to 20 million as that percentage from 20% climbs upwards closer to 80% for best practice organizations. Now, just because cash is expensive for vendors, it's fair to say that it's also more expensive for your organizations. So it's not quite as simple as saying, let's pursue every early pay discount. What it means though, is that there's now a strategic opening for you to have with Treasury to figure out when it makes sense to pursue those early pay discounts versus when it makes sense to take a step back and think about when you might not want to. So the old rule of thumb was if the early pay discount was 1% or less, it probably wasn't worth it. 1% to 2% maybe, anything 2% or higher was worth the effort and energy and resources to, to pursue it. Now the conversation is under what circumstances does it make sense to pay early, give up our cash earlier, in order to capture that discount. And depending upon where your organization is, what your cash flow is, there are opportunities where that may be a great decision or an opportunity where it makes sense not to pursue that early pay discount and sit on, on the payment for 30 days. But that only happens when you're able to have a strategic conversation with Treasury. <laughs> and the conversation kind of happens in, in two, different, two different dynamics. One is we're increasingly seeing salespeople coming to Treasury and saying, look, I've got a customer. He wants to buy our good or service. He wants to, to pay our asking price, but he wants to pay us over 90 to 180 days as opposed to 30-day terms. Treasury brings in AR, brings in AP, and says, all right, forecast what our cash position is going to be, forecast what our expenses are going to be over the next six months. We've got to decide right now whether we can pursue this sales opportunity and create a new strategic opportunity and advantage for us, or whether this would cause a cash crunch and bankrupt the company, so, so no pressure. The second challenge often comes in when you, when you, as your organization, has a business need for cash, right? Acquisition, building a new plant or big renovation. You've got to decide when it's cheaper to borrow versus when it's cheaper simply to, to hold payments. But this is not something that AP can do in its own silo, nor is it something that Treasury has the the ability to, to see, to understand without your help. And so this requires a true partnership between AP and Treasury to be able to make these strategic decisions, right? And in every case, it's no longer about AP being the people that pay the bills. It's about AP being the folks that can help Treasury make strategic decisions for the organization. So what's stopping you from pursuing these opportunities? Well, sometimes it's that you lack the visibility. If you don't have adequate automation in place, you may not be able to see 
which POs have an early pay discount and which don't, which you need to prioritize, which you don't. In that case, you're typically in a first in, first out kind of mentality, and those with an early pay discount at the bottom of the pile, if only they were moved up to the top, you could have taken advantage of this opportunity, but there's no way of tracking it manually. The other common challenge is around process efficiency, right? Sometimes you could have paid it earlier, but, but you lack the ability to route the invoice to the right processor fast enough, route it back to the approver and get that approval automated fast enough or to make the payment fast enough in order to capture that early pay discount. And so automation of various kinds enables you to be able to overcome these challenges. But it's not just about telling Treasury that you want to make these changes. Often you need to show them, and you need to show them with hard numbers. One of the things that's most difficult when making the business case is that often organizations will come to We'll try to benchmark the performance, and they'll benchmark themselves against the top performing AP departments in the world. Organizations like Walmart, for example, process 100 million invoices a year. When you have that level of volume, you can justify as much technology as you possibly can, robotic process automation, artificial intelligence, et cetera, because you have the volume to justify whatever expense is going to come out on that end. However, not every organization has 100 million invoices to process per year. Many organizations are processing tens of thousands of invoices. And so the first conversation to have in this context is, where are we? What is our peer group? I'd like to, to pause for a minute to, to help you think through where your peer group is. So for our next survey question, we're going to ask, which of these peer groups make sense for you? Which of these peer groups best fit yourself, because here, here's, here's the challenge. I was giving a breakout session on our benchmarking data at a conference about a year ago, and there was a, an AP director that came in in tears, and she said, I've been working with this organization now for 20 years. I've been the AP director for 15. This is the best team I've ever had. We are dedicated. We are smart. But our CFO decided to benchmark every department inside this organization. And when it came to benchmarking AP, our, our costs were way out of whack, he told us. He said our, our, our costs compared to the best practices should only be a few bucks per invoice, an error rate of less than 1%, and neither of those are anywhere near true of us. And she said it was really frustrating because he's never expressed any interest until we started to benchmark. But the bottom line was he was comparing it to organizations that can justify high level of automation because they have very large invoice volume. And instead, her organization only processes 10 to 15,000. In other words, she would have been on the left side of this grouping. So while it'd be great to say that everybody should have a cost per invoice of a dollar an invoice, the reality is only 5% of you on the phone right now should be comparing yourself to that peer group. Half of you process less than 50,000 invoices per year. And so the cost is just order, just roughly somewhere in the 10 to $20 an invoice range. Let me define these terms so you can, you can better benchmark yourself. To be able to compare organizations on an apples to apples basis, what we do is take the total cost, uh, the total labor cost for your team. So we're looking at base, we take, we take everybody that is involved in the AP process, in our surveys, we identify everyone from the AP mailroom through the, your AP director, shared service director, take their combined base salaries, and then divide that total by the number of invoices per year. It gives you a gross number, and that's what these numbers represent. The reason we make it, we describe it at that level, is that if we start looking at variable pay, benefits, overhead costs, level of automation, maintenance, you would have if we were trying to compare 300 organizations, you'd end up with 300 different variables. So at a high level, when you're comparing organizations in as comparable apples to apples basis as possible, you want to make the math simple here. So in this case, per invoice volume, what we find is that for roughly half of you that have 50,000 invoices or lower, if, you're, if, you're, if your gross costs are under, say, $10, 
then you're probably in the right ballpark. If it's, le if it's more than $10, if it's less than $10, then you're doing great. And at the end of the day, benchmarking really answers two questions. The first question is, is my current performance good, bad, or somewhere in between? And then the next question, this is where we really get into the business case is, if we were to move up and invest a little bit more, how much more of an improvement might be realistic? This next slide takes a look at the same measurement, cost per invoice defined the exact same way, but rather than looking at invoice volume, which is sort of step one, whether you have enough of a, of a volume to justify investment, the next grouping is around to what extent have you automated enough? Um, because as you can see with the stair step, the level of automation drives process efficiency. So let's pause here for our third and final survey. This is gonna to be to identify your peer group. Now, let me explain why we're asking about e-invoicing here. What we found is that if we simply asked, how automated are you? That's gonna be a question that everybody's gonna define differently. There are many tools out there. There's different variations of tools. The inputs, the, the outputs from procurement that become the inputs to, procure, to AP are different. The outputs from your AP systems into the general ledger systems are different. And different combinations of tools can all be defined differently. What we found as a good proxy, however, is if we ask what percentage of your invoices are received electronically. In other words, what percentage of your invoices can come in that require zero manual intervention in order to be processed, that's typically the first thing that someone will fix when they automate, right? If, you, if you're investing significantly in automation, then you're not gonna have a lot of paper invoices that can't be utilized by your processing system. On the flip side, if you're able to, if you, if you have invested in automation, then you're in a better position then to work with your vendors to receive more invoices electronically so you can take advantage of of the automation systems that you have. And what we find is that, again, 52% of you fall into those first two buckets. So just over half of you are in that limited to low level of, of automation. Again, not surprising given that roughly half of you also have 50,000 or fewer invoices that, uh, 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 invoices that you process per year. That being said, the opportunity therefore means that with that level of automation, somewhere in the $8 to $13 per invoice range is realistic. If you're higher than that, then there's opportunities for improvement. If you're significantly lower than that, then you're doing some things right. You probably have some world-class processes, even if you haven't allowed automation to take hold. The other thing I want to point out, both with this chart and the slide right before this, is the stair step that we see with every level of increase in invoice volume, which typically follows as you make acquisitions, for example, the number of invoices could double, but rarely does the number of AP staff increase. And here with low level of automation, what we find is a stair step. As you increase the level of automation, the, the cost for invoice declines, which means that there, there's this wall. There's only so much inefficiency from people on process that you can ring out without making that next level of investment. The other thing that's important to note is that at, at, at the beginning of your automation maturity journey, the cost savings are tremendous. We're talking just orders of magnitude here, almost $5 in invoice when you go from low to limited automation. When you go from less than 10% of your, your invoices coming in electronically requiring no manual intervention to less than 30%, even just that small moving of the needle can make a, a pay big, big dividends. The, the rate of decline in costs aren't quite as steep the rest of the way, but typically at that end of the spectrum, when you're looking at significant to high um, levels of automation, you're also dealing with higher volume. So being able to shave $1.50 off the cost per invoice is tremendous when you're dealing with hundreds of thousands of invoices. The other thing that's, that's important to note here is that automation can also drive the frequency with which you pay POs on time. So same definitions here, but the reason why we did this is I wanna take a step back. When we asked for your paid on time rates, we asked a question to help qualify folks. We asked, when do you start the clock? And we weeded out everyone 
that starts the clock on pay on time rates with anything other than the date of the invoice. 40% of, of folks say they measure pay on time rates when the invoice is received by AP, or those that say they, they start the clock after the invoice passes a three-way match. As you know, most of the challenges that delay the AP processing timeframe are things that happen before that invoice is received by AP. It's all of the things that happen up to the point of, of, of handing off that invoice to AP that can cause the biggest slowdown. And so we only looked at those organizations that start the clock on pay on time rates from date of invoice, not receipt. And what we found is that even those that, that just want to pay at least 90% of the invoices on time without at least some automation, it's virtually impossible to even hit that 90% benchmark. Of note, though, is the more you automate, the more likely you are, the greater ability you have to pay those invoices on time. And keep in mind, this is paid on time rates, so average pay terms are net 30. So if your goal is to pursue those early pay discounts, or that's the business case you want to make to treasury and to others, then if you can't even pay 90% of your, of, your, of your POs on a 30-day basis, then you're going to have a really hard time identifying those that you can pay on a, on a net 10 basis. Again, automation is the driver here. So just to recap, automation helps to mitigate compliance risk and also drive profitability. The one thing that you'll notice that I have not mentioned, and I just want to point out that I didn't mention this intentionally, is by no means does, does the efficiencies created by increase in automation, should that be construed to mean a reduction in headcount? Um, this is an argument that we often hear from folks outside of AP who claim that the reason why they want to drive greater investment in automation is to reduce the labor costs. The argument I would make to those people is that that is incredibly, incredibly short-sighted. And I'll give you two quick, quick examples. One, I was talking with an AP director who um, had a 14-person AP department. They automated against her wishes. Post automation, they, they reduced the headcount from 14 to nine. Fast forward a couple years, that formerly 14-person AP department now employs 18 people. Did the automation fail? Did it not generate the efficiency she was hoping for? Absolutely not. In fact, the opposite happened. Because the automation enabled them to be so much more efficient, they were able to take on higher value tasks. They were able to help Treasury with big strategic decisions. They were able to do big data analytics, looking at all the invoices, because AP is the only department inside an organization that has access to how every penny is spent. And three, they were able to um, deal with, with compliance issues that before may not have gotten the full attention that, that they wanted. And so to, to be able to, to take advantage of those opportunities, they were able to justify increasing headcount. Now, in hindsight, she would have loved to have kept those people. And she said that was the big lesson for her, to fight to keep those people during, during a, an automation cost savings. Second story, even if there are you are fighting an uphill battle to reduce labor costs. Often what we see at big organizations is finding opportunities for folks inside of AP elsewhere in finance. So Johnson Johnson, for example, when they went through a massive transition through automation uh, in a transition to a shared service center, they ended up being able to do so without reducing or eliminating a single position. Now, to be fair, in some cases, folks just naturally retired and moved on and they didn't backfill those positions. But in other cases, what they're able to do was find other roles. If you think about the skill set that AP people have, it's great for internal audit, great for other roles with, within, within finance. And so the bottom line is when you're selling the value of AP to senior leadership, when you're selling the value of automation, speak the language of risk, speak the language of increased profitability and and fight <laughs> the 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 short sighted argument that this is the ability to reduce headcount. So Josh, when you're talking with your folks in Treasury, is this a story you think that would resonate with them? Yeah, Jess, thanks for sharing that story. That Johnson and Johnson story is very encouraging to me. 
I think it's a great case study of how AP can add value throughout the organization. Um, and really, you know, it speaks to my heart because I've been involved with several organizations that have considered things such as outsourcing AP. I've, I've been close to a couple CFOs who did that and, you know, later went, went on to resent or actually regret that decision and, and kind of wish they could rewind a little bit and ended up staffing up their AP departments anyways um, as the outsourcing just introduced more inefficiencies and, and bigger headaches. I believe AP is well positioned to add value in any organization. And when I was approached about this topic, I was pretty excited because I've been in organizations that have had great partnerships between AP and treasury and procurement. And I think there's just a ton of value and, and, and work that can be done there. Um, that, you know, if, if the AP department is, is proactive and collaborative with the treasury team or the procurement team, they just have so much um, under their control and in their purview that there's value on, on both sides. You know, and I, I believe AP has a lot of key data, reaches a lot of touch points in their engagement with suppliers, and ha ultimately has control over which payments go out, timing of those payments, and, and the payment method used in sending those payments. So with all that, there's just so much they can do if they're engaged properly with Treasury or procurement. You know, more and more, I, I, I talk to treasurers of large organizations and, and AP leadership throughout organizations, and the more and more I, I, I speak to these folks, I, I, I better understand, you know, what, what some of the challenges might be. You know, I was working with a multi-billion dollar hospitality company recently, and it was interesting to watch the, the interaction between treasury and AP. When I first, when I first kind of arrived, the, what I'd heard was the treasurer was actually asking AP to adjust their pay runs. So they were currently on a weekly pay run in accounts payable and, and the Treasury Department wanted to have more control and better visibility into what went out and when and try and maximize their, their, their float and, and their working capital. And so Treasury was suggesting to AP that they actually hold back and, and sometimes send payments, sometimes don't, but, it, but go off a weekly process and, and introduce a very manual kind of as Treasury dictates type of process, which obviously isn't beneficial really for anybody in the organization, let alone the suppliers, uh, and definitely not something that, that most AP departments really want to handle or are equipped to handle. And so what, what I saw is, it, is, it, is a really big win for accounts payable there was they were able to come back to Treasury with the right analytics and the right business case for automation and, and prove out how they could actually benefit Treasury and, and their concerns and their kind of needs um, without adjusting their pay run, with keeping their pay run consistent and really returning more back in terms of cash to the Treasury Department in terms of returns that, than they were currently getting um, and keeping that weekly schedule. So that's what I want to focus on today. I really want to just kind of dive into, you know, what does Treasury do? What are they concerned about? What are their focus? And how AP can assist that and how AP can add value there. And Jeff spoke about this a little bit, kind of touched on a couple points. And so I just want to get deeper into some of those things and actually walk through a very specific example that I've come across and have dealt with um, in these interactions between Treasury and AP. So that's what we'll focus on today. The Treasury, one of the Treasury's biggest areas of focus is obviously cash management. And cash management can be a very complex and challenging, challenging balancing act. It's, it's difficult because there are a lot of different parties involved and a lot of different pieces to it. And as you can see in the slide here, one of, the, one of the major things is managing the cash account so that they're providing liquidity to the business and meeting financial obligations. And in that, they're also trying to reduce risk. So mitigate risk, avoid you know, penalties, things Jess had talked about, as well as erroneous payments or fraudulent payments, or payments going out that you know, put the, 
the cash position at risk so more strategic payments aren't able to be met or some strategic suppliers aren't able to get paid on time. And so it's a very difficult balancing act Treasury has. And to do that, they're pulling funds from their investment accounts um, to ensure they get a 2 to 3% annual return. They're also potentially uh, pulling off operating lines of credit or certain loans, which cost 5 to 7%. And while they're doing that, they're also relying on, and I would say that most treasurers are well known for having great banking relationships. I think Treasury and accounts payable as well should point this out, that the relationships on the other side are just as equally important. Um, the, the relationships that Treasury has with accounts receivable and accounts payable are just as important as the relationships they have with the banks. The key relationship there being the accounts payable team, because there's more that you can do to actively manage accounts payable. And with a strong relationship there, Treasury can really benefit in terms of better cash management, in terms of better cash forecasting, um, liquidity management, and, and what I'm about to show is better return on idle cash. So how can accounts payable help? Well, I would suggest if you're an accounts payable, try to be analytical. Try to think of things from the Treasury's perspective. Remember that they're pushing and pulling money in and out of their cash accounts to be able to fund the operations of the business, minimize the risk of the cash flow, and get a return on what cash is idle. When I was at Microsoft, it was always, always interesting to hear the CEO talk about his favorite department being Treasury. And that's because it was the only profitable uh, G&A department, especially within finance and accounting, um, the organization had. And so the treasurers really had a significant job there, and they had a large cash balance that they had to manage. And so Treasury's job can be very challenging, and it's important because the returns, to maximize those returns, you've got to ensure that the, the payment risks and the other risks associated with getting those kind of yields aren't, aren't, don't blindside you and end up catching you in a, in a terrible cash position. So what can accounts payable do? Well, develop a holistic payment strategy. And what I mean by this is evaluate, as Jess was mentioning, the opportunity for early payment terms with your suppliers. Work closely with procurement, get involved in those negotiations or discussions, and report back to procurement on how many of those early payment terms are actually being met and how many suppliers that aren't even on early payment terms that may, may decide to take, take them. Another way to in your holistic payment strategy is to consider your payment methods. Electronic versus print check. I was encouraged to see how many folks on the call here were actually at 50% or less on print check, and I think about a quarter of the respondents were 25% were or less. That's very encouraging. And in the industry, we, we often see that a large, large number of organizations are still, still paying by check to quite an extent. And I think what I talk about in my next slide might speak to that a little bit, and it gave me a little better understanding of why that is. Another thing accounts payable can do is assist with cash projections. So having the, the insight into the invoices and which invoices are getting approved, as well as which suppliers are strategic and which suppliers require to be paid on time and which suppliers have early payment terms, can really help Treasury with, with their cash projections. And that's, one of, I would say, one of Treasury's key performance indicators is cash forecast accuracy. And any treasurer that's doing a, a, a good job forecasting cash will engage with AP and, and really try and get a deep understanding of that. But it's on accounts payable shoulders to really provide the analytics that are useful and relevant to the cash forecast they're producing. And the third thing I would say is mitigating risk, especially when it comes to ACH. So one of the things that we've seen in the industry rise quite a bit are the bad actors out there who try to reach in and change banking information for otherwise good suppliers or, or good supplier banking information. And so it's important that AP secure that payment information, the banking information in particular with ACH, and determine the right payment methods to avoid those kind of cir circumstances. And lastly, and this is what I'd like to dive a little bit deeper into, is assess the value of disbursement float on check versus other payment alternatives. I've often seen with a lot of treasurers that check 
seems to be a very important vehicle for driving working capital and driving returns on idle cash. And what I'll show you in the next slide is that a big part of cash management is maintaining the float and getting the returns on that float. And I mentioned earlier that on their investment accounts, you might see two to three percent return on if you're operating off if you're working off an operating line of credit, you might see five to seven percent return on your idle cash. And, and by return, I mean savings and, and, and debt costs. So if if you've got cash there to pay down the debt and you're carrying a lower debt balance, then you're saving yourself five to seven percent on that debt. And really what this has to boil down to when it comes to the payment process and really what I call the disbursement float is just three to five days. Three to five days is enough to get Treasury excited and involved and interested in what you're doing with your payments. And funny enough, this tends to be a reason why a lot of companies stay on print check because of these three to five days. And I'll walk through some math, some math here in a minute and give you some particulars on what this really means. But the treasurer sees this float as additional cash in their reserves and additional cash to make returns on. And even at two or three percent, I've spoken with many treasurers who say that's a very important part of, of their overall performance measures and their overall performance within the group to show return on idle cash. And before I get to the, to the math, I wanted to talk more about the alternatives to check flow. So the treasurers has in, in their mind that we have this cash balance because of check float and we get this return on this cash, but they may not be thinking more holistically about all the different issues, concerns, and options beyond check float. And so what I wanted to kind of lay out here are a few different things to think about when talking to your treasurer if they bring this up as an issue or if they're being concerned with the way you're paying your suppliers. And a lot of times treasurers will interject and, and suggest you just pay by check. Well, we all know check costs are very high. It, it's one of the highest, way, highest cost ways um, to pay a supplier. It's one of the highest cost ways for a supplier to receive the funds. And ultimately, the, the supplier receives the funds late. But we all know it, we're all familiar with it, and it, and it just becomes somewhat comfortable. And of course, the treasurer's used to getting their float on that check. Unfortunately, check has other issues. The errors and fraud risk associated with check are, of all the payment methods, historically the highest. And it's important to note that one of the things, or I would say one of the major things that Treasury cares about is reducing risk. So pointing out that check fraud is, is very prevalent and it, and it could introduce a pretty significant amount of risk to the organization will resonate with that Treasurer and they'll understand, okay, makes sense. And I'll, I'll hit on that a couple more times throughout the presentation. There is an opportunity to offset costs paying by check, but they're small. One is the check float that I mentioned, and then I'll go into some more detail here in a minute. The other is possibility of paying early and getting early payment terms. However, you'll find that when you're paying by check, the early payment terms are less appealing to the supplier because they're receiving the funds later. And there's actually a reduction in check float if you pay by pay early as opposed to the standard terms. And so the return on the early payments or the early payment discounts should, should be considered in with the check float loss. And I'll, I'll walk through that math as well. Another payment method that a lot of suppliers are demanding today and that we're seeing a lot of companies move to is ACH. And ACH is, is an interesting payment method that I think is very very solid, very sound, but there are some holes in it that aren't necessarily well publicized. One of the things we've done is we've gone through and we've studied and researched all the costs to support an ACH program. And we've looked at a lot of our customers and tried to understand, you know, what is it about ACH that, that drives up those costs? And we have some great information and some great data into what actually happens with ACH and why banks are willing to offer ACH payments for five cents per payment, 20 cents per payment. I, I even know of some banks who offer ACH for free. Well, the devil gets into the details because where the ACH costs come from are when things go wrong. So if you have an ACH failure, it's very expensive. 
to, to go and to contact the bank and to look up the information and reconcile. And the bank's not really concerned with addressing that issue. So the bank will just charge the fee, they'll charge hourly time if they're needed to do research, and they'll, they'll require you resubmit another payment. And if you're lucky, they'll be able to cancel it in time before it's gone to the bank account. The other thing about ACH is the error and fraud risk is actually on the rise. More, more and more bad actors are focusing through social engineering on getting through to the AP department or the procurement department and trying to hijack that banking information that you keep on your systems. It's important to watch out for that. The, these, these bad actors, they have quite a bit of information if they're able to infiltrate your systems, can really start to understand who you pay and how much you pay them, and can be, be very sophisticated and patient about waiting uh, to get the right steps in place according to your controls or your process to make it seem like the bank information should be correctly updated, when in reality, it shouldn't be. The last thing I would add is there is an opportunity with ACH, given suppliers are actually getting the money, money sooner than on check, to capture those early payment terms. But ACH doesn't naturally return back anything on, on an early payment. The last thing I would like to talk about in terms of payment methods is virtual card. And there are many programs out there, and you may have spoken to your bank, you may have some of these programs in place now that offer virtual card. And the operating costs for virtual card are basically zero. They're, base, they're very small. To make a payment, you, you just submit your payment file, and your provider, your solution provider, or processor will do the rest. And there's no fees, simply submitting that payment file, no bank information. It's sent through, it's secure, and it's backed by the card issuer protection. So playing by virtual card is actually pretty compelling from a cost and fraud risk standpoint. The thing that will really resonate with Treasury is the 1% plus rebate you'll receive when paying by virtual card. Through, by paying through those payment rails, the issuing bank will pay back a 1% or your provider will pay back a rebate for those payments because that's essentially them taking care of the early payment terms for you. The supplier is getting more data, more information, and quicker payment, and paying a discount that then gets remitted back to you. And so virtual cards a payment method that you should consider in a more holistic payment strategy. With that said, let's go through the math. And I'm just going to walk through some details in terms of what the value is. And really, it's a calculation, and I've put this into a Excel model before that treasurers have found useful, that I've found useful as a treasurer. And so the float on check, this just happens naturally. And it's important to note that if you're 100% on check, you'll end up with over 365 days, average daily spend of 1.4 million. Now, if, you're, if your typical clearance period is three days, then that means treasury has an additional 4 million in average daily cash balance. And that's what they're concerned about. They like that 4.1 million because they earn 2% on that annually. And what does that translate into in terms of dollars? Well, in this case, with 500 million of spend on check, that means $82,000. And it may not seem like a lot, but that means quite a bit to Treasury. And a lot of times, that'll be included as one of Treasury's KPIs. And maybe not specifically float on check, but return on that cash balance. And more so, if they're paying on an operating line of credit, with a higher percentage return, or they've been able to extend the number of days before a check clears, then that could be fairly significant, up to three or 400,000 on that much in AP spend, assuming 100% of the spend is on check. But as we know, the cost of paying by check and the risk of paying by check really aren't worth it. And with so many suppliers demanding electronic payment to get paid immediately, to have payment data, to have, be able to reconcile their payments, check is becoming less and less desirable. So let's, let's move then to another example or an alternative to check float. So we're, and even with check, we could potentially capture some early payment discounts. But assuming we pay on ACH, what could those early payment terms look like? And what would the math on that be? So again, going back to our 500 million annual spend scenario, let's say, as Jess mentioned, 20% of the spend has early payment discounts, and we were able to capture 100% of that. 
that means there's $100 million eligible for early pay discounts. And again, if we're able to capture 100% of that and assume that the early pay discount is 2%, that's $2 million in value back to your organization. That $2 million far outweighs the 82,000 value of check flow. And it's important that the treasurer, if they're not already aware, understand that. Now, why is it 20% and not 100%? I think Jess hit on that a little bit. It's important to note, and you, you must take this into account when thinking about the math on that $2 million. When you're, when you're doing early payment terms and you're doing them specifically on ACH, there's a few things that happen to your financials. One of those things is you actually lose 20 days afloat. So if you're paying by check and you have 30, 30 days payment terms, then now you're paying and getting that 2% and paying 10 days, within 10 days, you've lost 20 days of float. And that's more than the 82,000 the treasurer's already concerned about. But what's another thing? Part of the reason why that percent of spend with terms is so low and is throughout the industry is because AP will need to work closely with procurement. And if that relationship doesn't exist, then things may start to break down. Now, even if that relationship is strong, procurement may not want to convolute their negotiations because they're dealing with pricing and terms and delivery and other discussions they're having with the suppliers with things such as early payment discounts. And if procurement's not confident that AP can capture the early payment discounts because of the outdated or, or, or difficult processes that AP must deal with, then, that percentage will drop even more, and procurement really has no incentive to get, get those suppliers under the payment terms. The last thing I want to talk about is the virtual card rebate. Now, this is driven out of AP with flexibility to be able to turn it off or turn it on as the supplier requests. And what we see across typical spend of $500 million is about 20% of that on virtual card. And if 20% of your virtual card, that's another $100 million. So you could have early payment terms and also have another portion of your payments paid out on virtual card. And really, this is what I mean when I talk about holistic payment strategy. And putting this into place, you're not only going to have the treasurer concerned over 82,000 check float, you're going to have them concerned over early payment terms, and they'll start having discussions with procurement. And now you're introducing a third method, which won't have to involve negotiations with suppliers, and that's virtual card rebates. And on that $100 million, you should expect to receive 1% or more in a rebate. And that rebate comes back to the organization, resulting in a million dollars of savings. On, and that's essentially the value of virtual card with no float loss. You're still paying it 30 days. The supplier is actually getting it sooner than they would on check. And so really, it's, it, it's a value to both sides. So that's something to consider when having a conversation with Treasury. And as I mentioned earlier, it's important to come forward with analytics and information and, and, and the treasurers really like to understand the math behind things and how they all kind of play out and will impact their KPIs. So again, I was very excited to hear about this topic. I think there's a huge opportunity for accounts payable to be Treasury's strategic partner. I think the complexities of cash management, as I discussed, they're rampant and they're out there and it's, it's really important for Treasury to partner with other parts of the finance organization. And I would, I would put it back on accounts payable to think more analytically. I know there are a lot of stories about reducing heads and automation. And I think with that automation, accounts payable, and given the amount of control and data they already have, have a huge opportunity to go and return a lot of value back to the organization, working with Treasury and procurement. The benefits and ROI of a strategic alliance with the nuanced management of DPO is going to be really key in terms of supporting your supplier base and managing through and, and maximizing these returns on idle cash. So again, think of a holistic payment strategy that reduces costs, minimizes risk, and ultimately ma maximizes returns, and perhaps even ask Treasury to start keeping on their KPIs the number of early payment discounts taken or the rebates, perhaps even sh have a shared KPI. And accounts payable can achieve all that, all of this, especially if they're able to free up some of their time from the manual process of paying by check or, or other manual processes with an intelligent payment automation solution and the right solution partner. So I would encourage you to look throughout the industry, look for partners out there. There are a lot of companies that offer this. We offer it as well. And we've, we've really focused on that, that exchange between the supplier and 
you or the customer and the relationships between procurement, treasury, 